goodness I would be desperate Without your love Slave to the darkness If it wasn't for the cross Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Antioch Outpost. I'm Janae, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about what's going on in our community. Parents, summertime is here, and that means it's time for VBS. Kids, kindergarten through fifth grade, come join us right here at Antioch Outpost for Mission Deep Blue. A week spent at VBS is an opportunity to deepen your kids' faith and relationships in bigger and more lasting ways. Please scan the QR code to register your kids as well as to volunteer. Ayo, listen, we get another opportunity to partner with foster families through our Jambos Pajama Drive. Jambos' mission is to bring comfort to children in the foster care system by providing them with brand new pajamas. You can give the gift of comfort to children in foster care by donating new pajamas sizes preemie up to adult double XL. Please drop them off in the donation box that will be located in the foyer starting today through the 28th. Have you accidentally left something behind here at Antioch Outpost? I have good news for you. We probably still have it in our lost and found. We will place all items found this month in the foyer on the last Sunday service of the month. Any unclaimed items after the service will be donated to a local charity. We want to thank you for your generosity. Here at Antioch Outpost, there are multiple ways to give. You can give online, through Cash App, by check, or here in person. That's a little bit of what we have going on here at Antioch Outpost. To stay up to date with what we have going on, please scan the QR code to sign up for our e-newsletter. Thank you for joining us today. Let's bless the Lord together.
Lord, that you'll have your way in this service. Lord, I thank you that your glory is already in this place, as people have just been praying and soaking this place with your presence. Just like that word I got, Lord, I just pray that our worship this morning will be like incense before your throne, that it will be a pleasing aroma before you. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome to Antioch Outpost. We're so glad you are here this morning. We're going to go into worship. This first song is about the name of God, Yahweh, and just declaring how glorious and powerful He is. Y'all just sing it with me loud. Oh, we love you, Jesus. There's nobody like you. Moving on the water, who is holding up the moon? Who is peeling back the darkness with the burning light of noon? Who is standing on the mountain? on the earth below, who is bigger than the heavens, and the lover of my soul, creator God, he is Yahweh, the great I am, he is Yahweh, the Lord of The righteous son is Yahweh, the free in one is Yahweh. Thank you, God. There's nobody like you. There's nobody like you, Jesus. Who is he that makes me happy? Who is he that gives me peace? Yes, you do, Lord. Who is he that brings me comfort and turns the bitter into sweet? Who is stirring up my past? Who is rising up in me?
completely you know what's crazy about worship is that we can't actually even worship God without his help like we can't we can't actually give him love without the love that he gives us first and so I just want us to take a moment and I just want us to hold out our hands like we're receiving a gift and just say God come and fill me with your love Lord come and fill us with your love this morning Fill us with love to give back to you. Lord, we're only giving back what you've already given us. Pray you'll fill every person in this room with your love. Oh, yeah. Let's sing us again together. Oh, we give our love back to you, my soul sings. My soul sings. My soul sings, my soul sings, how I love you, my soul sings, my soul sings, my soul sings, how I love you, oh my soul sings, my soul more than anything and this is our one desire and this is our sacred plea to know the love of Jesus oh more than anything and this is our one desire and this is our sacred plea to know the love of Jesus oh more than
is at hand it means that God is on the scene yes. his presence right here he's asking us to believe that he's at hand like your hand right here within reach within grasp And that presence is what we need in our marriage, in our families, for our children, for our finances, for those difficult relationships in our life. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
And whenever that was spoken in scripture, healings, miracles, and salvation followed. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So when we sing, we're gonna see those dry bones dancing. It's because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I don't wanna sing words about dry bones because I'm a believer and, and it's phrases that I've heard. I wanna see dry bones dancing. So we need to believe that the kingdom of heaven is at hand right now here right now we're gonna see those dry bones dancing we're gonna see the strongholds bow we're gonna see Oh 
I bow And the veil is torn The doors fling wide I see glory as I run inside the throne room Before you I bow I bow The veil is torn The doors fling wide I see glory as I run inside the throne
Lift it up. Lift it up. The song in your heart.
name of Jesus. Whoa, Jesus, the name of all other names. Lift up the name. restored can't save me no other name can restore no other name can heal my heart no other name but yours no other name can save me no other name can restore no other name No other name but yours. No other name can save me. No other name can restore. No other name can heal my heart. No other name but yours. No other name can save me.
Father, we thank you for meeting us here this morning. This is your house. I feel like we're, we're meeting you here. We're not necessarily inviting you to somewhere that's not yours. This is your house. We get to be here. We get to be in your presence. We get to sit at your feet. We get to hear you speak truth and life over us. Please prepare our hearts, Father, to receive what you have for us this morning. You have something for each one of us. Deliverance, freedom, healing, restoration. You have it for us today. It may not look exactly like what we're thinking, but you've got it for us. You've got what matters. You've got what we really need. We look to you as our ultimate need meter. We love you. We adore you. We magnify you. All those words in church that I've never actually really looked up to see what they really mean, but we do that, Father. We magnify you. We make you bigger than anything else in our life. Your name is great and greatly to be praised. You are marvelous. You are wonderful. Just a glimpse of you, Father, is all we need. Yeah. We're here to receive, Father. Put in our hands what you want to have in our hands. We open them up. We open them up. We face to you, Father. Be magnified and glorified, Father this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. My name is Nicole Parham, and I'm a first-year degree student at Caneo Ministry Training Center. What's impacted me most in my first year at Caneo is that I read my Bible differently, and I understand the scriptures in a deeper way, and it's impacted how I know and study the Word. I feel like that um, each class, I grow in a deeper understanding of what the scriptures are saying and what is actually happening. And understanding the scriptures has brought a deepening in my relationship with the Lord. And I'm developing skills to become a lifelong learner of the Word. I appreciate Dr. Karen's commitment to her calling as a teacher of the Word because she takes the time um, to spend time with the Lord and approach each class to receive fresh revelation from the Father. Year one was a giant leap of faith for me. I did not plan on going back to school, but I, it was made clear to me that it was God's plan for me. And through that process, I learned to grow in deeper dependence upon Him rather than what I perceived my own capabilities were to be. Each degree class was extremely pivotal during a very challenging season of my life, and they ministered to me in a, in a very individual way. No matter how long you've been walking with the Lord, I think everyone should consider becoming a Caneo student just to help understand the scriptures in a deeper way and deepen your relationship with the Lord. I love hearing the testimonies of first year Caneo students. Let me be honest, I love it even more when they're right here at Antioch Outpost. We are the Bethlehem campus for the Caneo Ministry Training Center. If you're interested in finding out more about how you can get your degree, your diploma, or even auditing a class that will better equip you for kingdom ministry, go to CaneoMTC.com and find out what all is offered there. Our new school year here at Antioch Outpost is going to start in the fall and you can secure your spot in month of May. We're cutting registration down from $50 to $25. That'll secure your spot, whether you do a campus, whether you do online or on demand. We're just encouraging you to listen to those testimonies of people that have already gone through it and consider if it might not be a good idea for you to follow the Lord in this upcoming school year. fostering for a long time. I really can't remember exactly how long. 
Well, we started when uh, about 33 years ago. Started out in a church service where we had a guest speaker come and speak to us about foster care and about adoption, about the abortion issues. And we left and we really, really felt strongly that somebody's got to be there for the children. Every child naturally wants their their birth parents. Yeah. We knew that uh, although we probably wasn't going to adopt them, that God was going to use them. Yeah, I grew up in a home without a dad. My dad left when I was about two years old. So I grew up with a mom who really couldn't take care of me. So we bounced around from family member to family member, and that's what I knew growing up. Uh, no fatherly influence. And my wife Sue had a very similar situation. She grew up without a father and a mother. There are high costs for these kids in foster care. It's estimated that about 70% of human traffic victims were at one time in foster care. It's estimated that about 65% of inmates have spent time in foster care. Our philosophy was if it makes a difference in one child, we're talking about human beings. We're not talking about used cars or something. We're talking about lives. We're talking about people. So if we can just get that one, if it's just one, it'll be worth it. I believe God's word does not return void. And that every single child, whether they were with us for one day, or forever that God's word does not return void and what we've put into them God will it's a seed that God will water to us it was like we just doing what was feeling you know what God was telling us to do any parent right now if you look at all your kids and then you think what if I would have decided not to have kids you you can look and see all that you would have missed out on you would have yeah. missed out on each one of those blessings. And that's how I look at it too, is I, I look at them and I think, I'm so thankful that God helped us to hang in there so we didn't miss out on these blessings. Before I went into foster care there, we, we didn't really have like, we had parents, but we didn't have any rules. We didn't have any structure. So like we did whatever we wanted to do. We all slept on the floor together. And um, my baby sister, Sadie, she was like one. Well, yeah, and um, she didn't sleep in a crib. And she slept on the ground with us and we would come home very late at night. We would go do dangerous stuff, hang around the wrong people. We would take care of our own siblings because our parents, they weren't home that often. And my mom, she was drunk a lot when she was home. She would hit us with a broom or like throw us across the room. Cause she was always mad when she was drunk. She would go above and beyond to me and my older sister and she would call us names and tell us that we would get nowhere in life and no one would love us. And like, we would never have like a family and all of that. And she would just tear us down and we were like, five and eight, and we, we didn't understand it. We were just like, you're just being mean to us. We don't know why. But I guess she was just hurting and she said all that. When our parents were home together, they would always be arguing, always have fights. Things would be thrown across the room. They would be hitting each other. And our older sister, she would take us out to like a neighbor's house or something or like outside. And when we would come home, our parents would have bruises all over them and the police would be there. So imagine, imagine that, having to live through They go through a lot of trauma, yeah. just not even their fault. My definition of family is having people that you can rely on and people that will be with you that, even though you're going through tough times, that they'll always be there and they won't give up on you. And they won't just trade you out for whatever, whatever they think more important and it's where you are where you feel protected and safe and 
you never have to worry if you're gonna like if you're gonna wake up one day and one of your siblings are gonna be dead or something's gonna happen and you'd always know that there's people there that will help you no matter what. I remember as a little kid I remember looking at like I would always watch YouTube and see all these families and I'm like I don't have that like and it was so sad and um, I just remember being very jealous that I didn't have It's been said that if every church in the United States would take one child and adopt them and parent them, we would no longer have a foster care system. It's one thing to uh, petition and to stand up and be uh, against all these things, but it's another thing to actually do something about it. Thank you for that video. That was a well done reminder. We have an opportunity. We talk a lot of here about having open hands. And uh, if we're, sorry, I'm a little <coughs> touched by that. It was, uh, we talk about having open hands and if we really mean it, uh, if we look around, we know that right here in this house, God has deposited an opportunity for us to get involved. And, and now what do we do? We're just holding it? No, our job is to be good stewards of that, what he's deposited here. We have family, foster families here, and there's an informational meeting, I think right after the service here down in the youth house. So as you're leaving and you see cars down there, you're like, oh, that's right. I wanted to be involved in that. Uh, we encourage you to come and do that. What a, great, uh, what a great video. Thank you, AV team and uh, EFA for, for the legwork on that. I appreciate the vulnerability and uh, everything. Well, hi, everybody. I know that I don't look like Jeff. I did hear an amen, but uh, I think he's, a, he's an attractive guy, and he's my bro, and we love him. Uh, my name is Kent. For those of you that don't know, and I have the honor to be with you this morning. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for showing up. Those of you, I saw some of you Wednesday and you knew that I was coming and you still showed up. I appreciate that. So I noticed a couple of things over the last couple of weeks of Sunday morning services. The first thing is Amy can preach. Now, I know this is not a surprise to many of you, especially some of you women that have sat under her before at the women's conferences and so forth, but man, what an incredible challenge for us last week. We appreciate the heart of God that came straight out of her mouth yesterday, her last uh, Sunday. I believe that it was a message for us. It was a call back to the front lines for our families and for our children specifically. Uh, man, I appreciate that so much. In fact, my message today was going to actually piggyback off of what she had uh, brought to us. Uh, but the other thing I learned over the last couple of weeks, it's okay for me not to have notes. Uh, it's okay for me to listen to the rhema word and, and deliver it. So I have all these notes. So here we go. Ready? Well, I'm not quite there yet. He, I'm not kidding. I don't have to have notes, but I've got notes this morning because I think he has a specific word for us uh, that he has laid on my heart and hopefully it'll uh, transmit through uh, this mumbling uh, man before you and uh, that I'll be able to convey what I think his heart is for us this morning. Uh, Pastor Jeff, by the way, is not here this morning. He is in uh, ministering in South Carolina. Um, so when he asked me a couple of weeks ago uh, that uh, he, he asked me to preach, I could have said no. Um, I was inclined to say no because it's always safer for me to have a guitar in front of me and, uh, and be able to talk and sing song. 
It's easier for me to do that. But I know that he's going to be a blessing to the church that he's ministering to in South Carolina, just like he's always a blessing to us. Uh, we love you. We miss you. Uh, thank you for serving the Lord and, and doing what you do. So I came to this realization a few months ago. God, in his gentle way, just kind of walked up to me and stuck his foot out and stepped a little bit on my toes. Uh, and then I was, I've been stewing over it for a little while, but when our senior leader, Jeff, asked me to preach, it was a, it was a no-brainer that this is where I was supposed to go because it's, uh, it's been ruminating in my heart. So here we go. I think that we choose safety. I think that we choose comfort. And we, I'm not just telling you like I'm not involved. This is an observation that I have for you people. This is an observation that I have for myself. I choose comfort. You know, I don't make the choices anymore that I used to make that put me in a position of desperation. So I, I am a part of a ministry on Monday nights, and I have been for the last 20 years, called Celebrate Recovery. And I am surrounded, when I'm there, I'm surrounded by people that are at some level of desperation. They don't wanna do it anymore. They don't wanna carry those burdens by themselves. They don't wanna make those rotten decisions anymore. So there is an invitation, there is an open invitation that Jesus gives us. And it's when we find Jesus, it's because we're in that, in that level of desperation. We just don't want, we just, it's too heavy for us. We can't carry it anymore. You know, maybe it's, maybe it's pornography has ruined some of your relationships. And I'm telling you that if it hasn't yet, it's going to. Maybe codependency or people pleasing has actually stolen your creativity, stolen your joy. Maybe it's caused you to compromise some of the things that you know better. Maybe we're using chemicals to fill that void. At any rate, we're desperate for a savior. We found ourselves beaten, busted, and desperate. But the great news is he is faithful. Amen? Amen? He is faithful and he wants to be our savior. We'll talk more about this at the end when we have a time, some time to respond. But our choices have put us in that position of desperation. We can't nor do we want to continue to do things on our own. So we put our dependence on the only name that's above every name. We sang it this morning, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, worship team. That was a tremendous uh, ushering us and, and dragging us along with you to the throne room. It was beautiful this morning. The danger, the danger is that we stay there. Like we no longer make those decisions. And, and you know, frankly, we really don't even need God's help. We don't need long, we no longer make those decisions that cause us to be desperate for him. Because you know what? I don't do the same things that I used to do. I don't make the decisions that destroy. I don't make the decisions that hurt my family. I'm a grown up. I can make those choices. I no longer swim in the same pools of selfishness and idiocy. With God's help, I no longer swim in those pools. The danger is to stay there. But when uh, the challenge is, I don't think that we're just supposed to stay there. I don't think that holiness is the destination. It is a goal. I don't want you to mishear me. It's a goal, but our journey didn't start in holiness. And I don't think that that's where God wants our journey to end in holiness. That'll get clearer as we move. I don't want to downgrade the importance of holiness. Please understand me. 
So we're going to look at a portion of scripture this morning that illustrates what I'm trying to tell you. And I'm not telling you, again, from a place of authority on this subject like I've already arrived. I'm preaching to myself. And I feel like it's my job this morning uh, to walk up to you very gently and step on your toes. I'm bigger than you. (laughs) Probably, on average. uh, And I will step gently. I think this message is important because we're coming into a time when God wants to pour out more of his spirit on his people. And I know that there are things to do for him. He has a will of things to do. And I don't know why, but he chooses people like you and me, broken people that understand what desperation is. He chooses to use us to get those things done. And we can't do it if we're safe. We can't do it if we're comfortable. We can't do it if we're complacent. I'm far less effective when I'm comfortable and complacent. And I believe that the enemy, even though I know he doesn't have my soul, his next step is to make me comfortable and complacent. That way I'll be less effective for the kingdom. So let's pray and I'll get into it. Father, it's my honor to be your mouthpiece this morning. You don't need me and I don't know why you chose me. But I yield. I yield to you. Pray that you would use my mouth to convey what you want to say, pray that you'd penetrate hearts so that they can receive what you have to say. You're my glorious king, so I do what you say. We give you honor and glory this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, do you feel like you're in church today? I'm gonna go ahead and give you my three points. So I had an introduction. I've got three points and a conclusion. I'm gonna give you the three so I don't forget. I appreciate uh, my friend Roger who always reads the scripture right up front and says, that way you know you're in church. So I'm gonna give you my three points. Worth considering when responding to Jesus' call on our lives. Number one, there's a desperation for salvation. Anybody desperate for salvation? in their lives. At one point, most of you should raise your hands. Yes, because we didn't find Jesus when we were comfortable. We found Jesus when we were desperate. Amen? All right, number two, desperation, not distraction. It takes courage to step into faith. And it takes more courage to take faith steps out of that safety and comfort into unknown and threatening circumstances. Number three, Desperation for dependence. Even when we doubt and are overwhelmed by what's happening around us, Jesus is still there to rescue and hold us up. The giant plus is he's sovereign. And I'll talk more about that later. So I'm gonna paint you a picture. I'm kind of a story guy, those of you that know me. So I was uh, in the summer before my ninth grade year. I don't know how old I was. Anyway, we were in Ecuador in a small Christian school, and uh, there was some male teachers and male administrators that were going to go on a mountain climb. And they invited some noobs to go with them. I was there for the summer, and my dad and I had never mountain climbed before, but they invited us along. And I'm not talking about a mountain hike. I'm talking about mountain climb. We had ropes tying us together. We had carabiners all over our belts. We had ice picks. We had cleats that we bolted to the bottom of our shoes. We had uh, snow glasses on and uh, the whole garb. And uh, so it it was no just ordinary afternoon hike. We were in the middle of the Andes Mountains in the summer, so it was beautiful. 
it was always beautiful there in Ecuador. But the summer uh, and the winter, because it's right on the equator, it didn't really, really matter. If you got low enough to the beach, it was always 80 to 90 degrees. And if you were up in the mountains in Quito, where I lived, it was always 70 degrees. But if you go up to where you're going to climb mountain, it's always a lot colder than that. So again, we drove until the road ended. Have you ever driven to the, where the road ends? And we had our evening before we were leaving for our, our mountain climb. And we were surrounded by these giant snow-capped mountains. Uh, Kayambe, which is one of the, I don't know the, that's probably the actual name for it. I mean, who am I to name the, the mountain? But it's Kayambe was right in front of us. It's 22,000 feet. Uh, that's not the one we were climbing. Uh, that one takes oxygen and a whole lot of other training than, uh, than what I had as a ninth grader, going to be a ninth grader. Uh, we were doing the one right behind us. It was called Caliwarazo. And uh, so we had the evening. It was a beautiful weather. You could, uh, we were having food, checking our gear, and looking out across the beautiful landscape. The goal was that we were going to get up before light. We had to get up early in the morning, uh, well before light, well before sunrise, to get up the mountain. We had to get up the mountain and then back down the mountain before mid-afternoon. Because mid-afternoon, the afternoon sun, right there, gee, you know what it is. It just kind of beats on that snow and it actually opens up some crevices and makes some of the crags and, uh, and, and slopes unstable. So we had to get up and get back down. So sure enough, we got to the snow line just before, or just after sunrise, we got to the snow line. And we were climbing up, and very soon we got to the point where we needed our gear all put on. We needed the, the cleats on our shoes and, and everything else, and we had the glasses. And um, we got to a slope that was so steep that I remember I could stand on it up the mountain and stick my hand out and touch the snow in front of me. So it was pretty steep. And we had two teams and the two different teams were all strung together with the ropes. And I was the last guy on the second team. The first team, man, they were doing the switchback. You know what a switchback is? You just walk this way up the slope and then you turn and you walk this way up the slope. It's very easy climb, but not my team. My team was led by straight testosterone. <laughs> Remember, I was in middle school, so I didn't have a lot of that coursing through my veins at that point. But the guy in front, he was all man, and he was leading us straight up that mountain. Ice pick, kick, kick, climb. Ice pick, kick, kick, climb. I was terrified. Remember, I was last in line. So it was a pretty important place to be, and I don't know why they put me there. But see, I can see if somebody in front of me falls and I can dig the ice pick in and grab a hold of it. But nobody behind me, there's nobody behind me <laughs> to see if I fall. There's nobody back there. So here I am just kind of <sighs> looking back and this slope down into fog. I couldn't even see the bottom of it. I was terrified, panicked, tears filled with emotion. I even remember the compounded uh, fear that I was actually holding up the rest of the team because I was codependent. I didn't want to be a disappointment to the rest of my team, but here I am paralyzed with fear. My father, he was on the smart team. He wasn't leading it or anything, but he was on the smart team. Now, a lot of us, some of us don't have smart fathers, but I have a smart father. I love you, Dad. And he, uh, he was on the smart team. They were doing the switchback, easy climb. And they were like, what's this kid crying about? It's so easy. And, uh, but he saw my panicked state. He saw my tears. And he actually unclipped himself. He made everybody stop. He unclipped himself and walked to where I was, he unhooked me, 
And then he walked while holding my arm. He was below me on the mountain, walked below me, walked me to his rope, hooked me up to his, and then he walked back down to mine and hooked up in my place. Yeah, whoa. What a picture, huh? What a picture of what Jesus did for us. If that's not a picture of what Jesus did for us, seeing us in our desperation, seeing our tears, and he heard our cries for help, so he came to where we were, and he took our place. Thank you, Jesus. It was a beautiful exchange. Well, we all died that day on the mountain. (laughs) Yeah, we all made it. There was no further uh, delays or anything except for a, a cliff wall that we had to climb. But I was in the middle of the group, so... Uh, we were better by that time. Anyway, we all made it back down. The only, we did have some great memories, made some fabulous memories, a beautiful story, all true. Uh, but I also came away with uh, sunburn that I didn't know you could get sunburned at because I actually had blisters under my chin. I had blisters under my lip. And I had blisters in my nostrils. I couldn't pick my nose for weeks. <laughs> because the sun was actually reflecting off the snow and shining up underneath me. So that was free, that little giggle. And also true. So we're gonna read today, finally we're gonna read today from Matthew 14. If you have your Bibles, please turn there. If you have your apps, go ahead and turn them on. If you want to or you don't have those things, they're going to be on the screen behind me. I'm reading from the New King James Version this morning. I want you to remember as we read this story where we came from, part of a context, right? So last year I, pro- I preached on, uh, or brought a message on Jesus feeding the 5,000. And this story comes immediately on the heels of that story. Remember he... Uh, fed the more than 5,000 people with the five uh, small loaves and the uh, two fish. Well, this is immediately following. We pick it up in verse 22 of Matthew 14. So after the feeding of 5,000, verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. While he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary Another version says, it was beaten by the waves for the wind was against them. It's a a picture of how I remember it. When we were hard pressed on every side and everything seemed to be against us. Verse 25. Now in the fourth watch, that's about 4 a.m. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. 
And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So, after a long day of preaching to the huge crowd, Jesus decides to walk home. But it's not an ordinary walk home. Our story begins with this amazing demonstration of his deity. The authority that Jesus has to walk on the water, to use the water as a path, to tame the water, control the water and the raging weather. Clearly, this is a demonstration that Jesus is God. In, in John chapter 10, Jesus says, I and the Father are one which is an exclamation of his deity, and this is a demonstration of his deity in Matthew 14. So this passage not only does that, but where I kind of want to focus is that it also lays out what it looks like to step boldly out in faith even when the world is full of fearful circumstances. I want this to be super clear this morning. Super clear. Jesus is our authority. He has the authority to command the waves and the wind, and he has the authority to be control, in control of every circumstance. This morning, I really want to focus mostly on how this extraordinary event affected the disciple Peter. So let's look at what Jesus does, and what he does is something extraordinary and memorable for Peter. So first, I want you to imagine Peter's reaction to the ghost-like figure seemingly floating along above the raging water. How would you react? I'm not looking for shouted answers. I, on a side note, Pastor Jeff asked me what I was preaching on. I said I was going to have an open mic and this look on his face <laughs> told me very clearly we are not having open mics, especially when he's not here, to manage that. So uh, I had him going for a minute. So I, when I ask you these questions, I just want you to search your heart, okay? Search your heart. I do appreciate the encouragement that comes from answers that if you shout them out, I know you're listening to me. But uh, I'm the only one with a microphone this morning, so uh, that's okay. So be honest. How would you react if you saw this ghost-like figure floating above, above the raging water? You know, I've actually heard some people, some preachers actually, express uh, a sort of criticism towards the disciples because, uh, of, course, of course it's Jesus. I mean, they just saw him feed the 5,000. Like, what's the big, why would they be scared? Like, they know. But I don't think that's fair. I mean, they've already been in the storm, so they're panicking, sort of. They don't really know where they are. It's in the middle of the night. Uh, you know, there's no uh, landmarks or anything that they can see. Uh, the, the wind and the waves and the water are just pounding the boat. Uh, the wind is against them. So they're, they're frustrated, they're, uh, they don't really know where they are. I, I think that that's, um, you know, I, I think that they probably thought they were in serious danger. Afraid for their very lives. But then Jesus spoke and he said, be of good cheer. It is I. Don't be afraid. I noticed one thing there that Jesus didn't say, come on, be calm, it's me, Jesus. He just had to say, it is I, because he knew that the sheep would know the shepherd's voice. And that was enough to set him at ease. In fact, so much at ease that Peter then called out over the noise and the wind and the waves and the storm, 
Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. I think that's another interesting choice of words, command me. He didn't say, let me come out there. He didn't say, invite me to come out there. He didn't even say, tell me to come out there. He said, command me. Peter knew who was in charge in this situation. He had confidence and trust that when Jesus commanded something, that it was going to happen. So confession time. If I was in the boat and I saw Jesus coming, walking on the water in the middle of the rough sea in the middle of the night, my first reaction would not have been, can I do that? My first reaction was said, let me slide over. I got a seat for you right here, Jesus. What, do you need a rope? I'll throw you a rope. That's probably what I would have said. Because I know me. But Peter in this moment, I mean, maybe it was a blind sense of adventure. My brother has this sense of adventure, I think, uh, beyond what mine is. But uh, I could see my brother doing this. But Peter, maybe it was a sense of adventure, but I think it was probably more of a spike in his faith. He did the unexpected. So when I look at churches around, uh, and I'm talking about Big C Church, I'm not talking about Antioch Outpost uh, specifically, but it's here too. I see people asking God to come and meet them where they are. Come, get in my boat, Jesus. God, please come and heal me or heal my family member. God, I need money. I don't have enough money for gas. Please come provide my needs. These, I'm not downplaying these things. They're all good. They are things that we need to take to the Father. But I'm saying that to draw a clear delineation, a clear line between that and then what Peter is actually doing in this passage. Peter is asking Jesus if he, Peter, can come and join him, Jesus, out on the water. It's what I like to call stepping out into our faith. You know, we do a lot of, if, you, if you've been here for any amount of time, you know we do a lot of remodeling around here. Constant remodeling. But I want to be very clear, it's not to make this place beautiful so that Jesus can come and see it and say, oh, I love what you've done with the lights. I think I'll stay. I, I mean, God can say what he wants, but I can't imagine him saying, Antioch Outpost? That's a very cool name. I think I'll stay and see what's going on there. When the Lord shows up, which is our goal here, each and every time we meet, when the Lord shows up, it's only because we are coming into agreement with what he is doing. That's why our praise and worship has shifted over the last months to be more in line with what's currently happening in heaven. 24 hours, praise, worship. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It's intentional. Revival and renewal is happening all the time, but it's only where he is. It's happening here. It's happening in Dawsonville. Happening in college campuses around. It's happening overseas. What's the common denominator? Him. He's the common denominator. That's right. Where he is, is where revival is happening. It's not just a revival if we call it that. He's got to be there. So there are faith steps that we have to take to go where he is. Remember what the Bible says. It tells us that faith without action is dead. I think it's James 2. The end of James 2 uh, says that the, uh, the body apart from the spirit is dead. 
just like faith without works is dead. That's the Mangum paraphrase. Faith without works is dead. And in a very practical way, I believe that Peter is modeling this verse for us. He's actively asking Jesus to allow him, in fact, command him to step out into the water, into the storm. And then he, Peter, is putting into action his request. Not only did he demonstrate faith by asking Jesus if he could, it was another bigger step of faith to actually step out of the boat. Especially remember at this point in the passage that we read, the storm is still raging around him. So like the raging storm on the Sea of Galilee, that dark night, our lives and our world is so busy, so complicated and demanding and even threatening that our faith gets drowned out and overpowered by life circumstances. We're so focused on our little storm that we forget that Jesus who commands that storm, actually invites us to step out in faith and then join him where he is. It seems to me that we ought to be asking ourselves every day, what am I doing to step out into faith that day? I'm much more comfortable asking God to step into the safety of my boat and help me fix my problems But how willing am I to step out, out of my safety zone and to go where God is and join him in what he is doing? And that's what I want this morning. That's what I want for me. That's why I'm preaching, to be honest with you. And that's what I want for you as well. Maybe you're sitting here this morning not knowing that you have ever fully put your faith in Jesus. Well, I've got good news. God has given us the free gift of salvation through Jesus. The perfect son of God took took our sin upon himself, gave himself up for us on the cross, paying paying the penalty for our sin debt. This morning, in order to receive his free gift of forgiveness and salvation, we must put our faith in Jesus and then allow him and then follow him. Sorry. This is the most important decision of your life. So if you haven't made that decision, don't make it lightly. Romans Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You guys okay? Okay. Um, it's 12.02 right now. So I don't talk fast. So settle in. (laughs) What's so important about faith? Well, first of all, it's the active expression of our thought and feelings for our God. Peter in this story recorded in Matthew 14 is expressing through his actions that he is putting his trust in Jesus. In spite of the darkness, in spite of the wind and the waves, in spite of the problems and complications and potential disasters, he is stepping out in faith. Another quick story. I have a great grandfather. His name is George W. Bush. No, George George W. Braden. You didn't know I was lying then. George W. Braden, he was at a church service early in his life up in Ohio, and uh, there was a, it was a missions conference week, and the missionary that was speaking that night was telling him of the, or telling the, the crowd there of the amazing things that God was doing on the field where he was called to serve. And then he closed his message by saying, Arabia is closed to the gospel. Who will go and open up this land? Who will go and explain the gospel to this unreached people group? And George W. Braden stood up and said, I'll go. Well, on their way home, he turned to Lola May, his wife, George and Lola May, that's true, and was gonna talk to her about his decision or his commitment that he had, declaration that he had made. And she said, well, if you hadn't stood up, I was gonna stand up. There's a problem. 
It's not peaches and cream. The problem is that my great grandpa George was actually the oldest son of his father, which means that he was set in line to inherit this really lucrative business in Ohio. It's called the Trinity Company, or the Treaty Company, sorry. And so he had this, this safety net around him, this successful business. He's already set on a trajectory of life. Uh, and he was a little bit scared to tell his father, but he went to tell his father what the Lord was doing and it was met with such resistance. His father said, you know what? If you decide to go overseas, you don't get any part of this company. I'm writing you out of my will. You're not getting any, any uh, help from me and you can't contact us anymore. Storms, waves, wind. So he had to make a choice. He could either do what his, father, his earthly father did or said to do and stay there in the safety zone or he could step out in faith and do what his heavenly father was calling him to do. Well, he chose to go on the path that Jesus called him to. And in that obedience to God's call, they started moving in that direction that he laid on their hearts to do. Their lifelong ministry of 40 years in the Middle East laid a strong foundation for many churches that are still there today. Not only that, but their missionary minds and hearts and their passion for telling people about Jesus has now filtered down through five generations. God honored them. God honored them in the same way that God honors all those who choose to trust and then step out of their safety zones and exercise faith in Jesus. Amen. All right, confession time. This is my confession. I'm not gonna ask for raised hands, but let's be as honest as you can in your heart. Don't we find ourselves hesitant to step out of the safety of our boats? Aren't there often this multitude of valid, reasonable concerns that need to be resolved before we can take the first step out of the boat? Aren't there legitimate concerns that have to be resolved, storms that need to die down, wind that needs to die down, waves that need quieting. But what did Jesus say? Don't be afraid. Imagine the sense of absolute amazement when Peter began to step out of the water, onto the water, and began to walk in the storm. I mean, it's unimaginable. Unimaginable, really. Well, we don't know how quickly it happened. We don't know what prompted it. Maybe it was the wind in his face or an especially large wave. Whatever it was, we know that he was suddenly distracted and his eyes shifted away from Jesus and onto the storm that was crashing around him. And doubt quickly overtook him and he began to sink. Peter lost sight of the authority that Jesus had over his circumstances and over the threats around him and over his narrow vision of his little world. And because of it, Peter's faith weakened and then failed. Now, I wanna say this in Peter's defense. Remember that Peter was a fisherman when he was called. And James and John, who were still in the boat, by the way, behind him, were also fishermen when they were called. Don't you think that his natural instinct would have been to swim for it? or to turn and yell, throw me a rope! But that's not what he did. What did he do? Jesus, save me, is what he did. So he put aside his instinct, which is our self-preservation instinct, and he cried out to Jesus. And then, Jesus reached out and pulled him up out of the water and gently said, oh, you of little faith. 
Why did you doubt? Well, there's a lot that we don't know about what followed. I don't know how far away from the boat they were. I don't know if there was more to that conversation. I can imagine Peter saying, I'll try, I'll do better next time. What we do know is that when they got in the boat, the wind ceased. So I just have a few quick observations about that section. Listen now. We're, we're going to close here in a minute. Here's what we learned from Peter's mistake. Even when we doubt what God has permitted for us, and even when we begin to sink into the failure and despair and maybe even the hopelessness, Jesus is there to rescue us from our fears. Most of us know that, right? This world is full of things that take our attention away from Jesus. Fear, worry, doubt, distractions, and realities that are in this present world. Any of it, all of it can be used by the enemy to draw our gaze off of Jesus. Number two, I added that word gently. I think Jesus said, oh, you have little faith. I think that was gentle. And I think it was gentle because of my experience as a father. See, I don't ever get frustrated with my kids. What? Now you know I'm lying. All right, that's not true. But I know that I don't get frustrated with them when they try hard things. When they try hard things. I'm very proud of it when they try hard things. And you know what? I'm evil. So how much more, right? So I don't believe that Jesus said that in a frustrating way. The way that we can sometimes hear it, but you know what? That's not Jesus' voice in our ear. That's the enemy that sounds like he's frustrated with us. Makes it sound like he's frustrated with us. So I challenge the notion that that frustration comes from the Heavenly Father. God loves it when we try hard things for his glory. He's not frustrated when we stumble. Number three, there's a lot of reasons that Jesus tells us not to fear. Perhaps the root of all of those reasons is that we serve a sovereign God, one that controls the winds and the waves, one that hung the moon and stars in place, the one that holds the earth in his hands and created it with one universe. I said it a long time ago one night here at a testimony night. And I heard my brother say it before that. And I've seen generation after generation in my past of people that have acted this out. And you know what? We can read it right here in scripture. And if you want to know what a faith step looks like, turn to Hebrews 11 and read that one. It's like the hall of fame of faith. And that's this. We are invincible until our sovereign Lord is done with us here on earth. I don't want you to mishear me. Please understand that if you play stupid games, you will win stupid prizes. But it does mean that if we're living by faith for the only one that is worthy, then we don't need to fear anything, right? Paul says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. That's why we don't need to fear. If we're living for his glory, we don't need to fear. Worship team, come on up. We're gonna close here in a minute. So in these closing moments, let me pull our thoughts together. This great little story about Jesus and Peter walking on the water. What it teaches us or maybe reminds us of three very important life lessons. First, there are always important faith steps for each and every one of us to take. Jesus is always inviting us into faith-filled action. And his first invitation is that we come to him in salvation, desperation for salvation that we accept him as our Lord and Savior. 
Most of us have done that. But remember, that's only the first of his invitations. For us who have already responded to that first invitation and are now followers of Jesus, his disciples, he continues to invite us out of those comfort zones into bold and fearless living, lives of adventure, service to him and with him. You're not doing it by yourself. So second, there's a sober warning in this story. The world full of distractions that want to pull our eyes off of Jesus and focus on them and the threats and attractions, storms and disappointments that are all around us. We need to guard our hearts. Peter, the same guy that, we talked, that we've been talking about, wrote in 1 Peter 1.15, he who has called you is holy, so be holy. So we can't get distracted. We have to be consecrated to him. Finally, there's a faithful promise. The promise is that Jesus is always there to help us, even rescue us if we get distracted and falter or fall or sink. We need to constantly remember that he is the one who can help us. Turn to him. He's already overcome the world. He's up there walking on the water. He's the answer and ready to reach out and pull you out of your troubles. You got to trust him. You have to trust, but then you have to obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. It doesn't stop with trust. You have to obey. I wonder if when they got back in the boat and after the storm called, calmed down, we don't read this anywhere except for later, Peter wrote this too. I wonder if Jesus didn't say, remember, you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation belonging to our God to declare the praises of him who brought you out of the storm into his marvelous light. Father, we're a congregation with open hands. I pray that you would fill those hands with courage this morning as you've called us to respond. It would be a shame if we didn't. Father, this time is yours. Minister to hearts, I pray. I pray in Jesus' name. So let's respond. Worship team's gonna play a song and I want you to search your heart and I wanna see if you fit into one of these categories. We we'll have a prayer team up here. If you guys wanna go ahead and come. We'll have a prayer team. If you want to come forward and would like or would need prayer, we're here to pray with you. Number one, you need a savior. The wind and the waves are crashing around you. Life has been a treacherous trek for you. You've been making decisions that have left you in that desperate place. And I can imagine that you're tired of carrying all of these circumstances on your own. There is rescue for you. There is a savior that wants to carry all your burdens. The price has already been paid and that open offer is on the table. A free gift for you of eternal life for the rest of your life and by the way, never having to walk alone again. If this is you, now is your time to come forward. One of our prayer teams would be overjoyed to pray with you this morning. Number two, maybe you're safe in the boat and the storms are raging around you and you're holding on to the sides of that boat and you've tied your, the ropes around your legs and the life preservers all around you because you're trying to lean on your own understanding of how to save yourself from the storm that's raging around you.
You're trying to live this faith life while we're still relying on our own understanding. You're real comfortable. You're real content still having control of at least some of those circumstances that are going on in your life. But I challenge you because your faith in that instance is duplicitous. Because you're putting your faith not just in yourself and not just in Jesus. But I'm calling you to single-mindedness this morning. Single-mindedness this morning. Follow him and do what he says. Trust and obey. If you've been double-minded, and want to change that, then now is your time to come forward and repent. I'm with you. You won't be rejected. You won't be turned away. God is not the condemning one. We condemn ourselves by living that way. God's voice is not one of condemnation. He wants you to win. In order to win, you gotta surrender. So if you've, if you've tried living that way, now is your time. One of our prayer team would be happy to pray with you. Number three, maybe you've already stepped out of the boat. I know there's a couple of you at least in this place that have already stepped out of that boat. And you've already told God, I'm all in. But you just don't know what next steps to take. Maybe you said yes and you trust him. You just need somebody to pray with you into that. So one of our prayer team would be happy to pray with you. So let's respond right now to the Holy Spirit's guidance as the worship team leads us this morning. Do whatever you want to And I will make 
strength of the Holy Spirit. We love you guys. Uh, be, be conscientious to those that are dealing here at the altar. Just take any conversation outside. Love y'all. Please continue. Shake up the ground with all my traditions.